In this section of our Worldviews and Values class, we are going to look at one of the great works of Western literature, one that's been incredibly influential throughout the ages, both by people p taking it up and, and going further with these ideas, and by people totally opposing them and saying that they're, they're the root of terrible uh, mistakes and, and evils. And this is Plato's Republic. Now, we're looking at just portions of the text. We're not looking at the entire work, which is quite long. So we're going to be focusing on those that have to do with some of the key themes of this class, which are human nature, our relationship with other people in human society, and our connection to the broader reality that encompasses both human beings and their, their cultures and societies. And why are we focusing on this particular work? Well, this is an easy one to say. It's had a massive influence throughout history in a number of different fields, not just philosophy, but also education, political theory, um, literary criticism. We could just go down the line. There, there are a number of different fields where Plato has exerted a, a considerable influence. And he's developing a, a theory of the human person, what we call a philosophy of human nature, that we want to take a look at because it's been also incredibly influential. People who were not exactly Platonists often took certain elements from it. He also talks about some other really key things, the goods that comprise human life. Um, he develops a, a utopian view on society, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, as we'll talk about later on, uh, but one which influences later utopian literature. And he develops some, some brilliant metaphors that we want to take a look at, including the allegory of the cave. Now, we want to think with all of these works that we're looking at about genre, we want to think about context, and then we want to think about some of the main ideas or themes that we're going to focus on. So let's talk about, about genre first. What we have here is a philosophical dialogue. The portions, that is parts of book two, uh, three, all of book four pretty much, a um, little bit of book six and a little bit of book seven, in that part it's not quite as dialogical as some of the other parts of this, this work. But it's still dialogical in that you've got a conversation going on. Much of the conversation is people saying, Socrates tell us more, and Socrates doing precisely that, saying, well, here's my ideas about this. They do ask questions from time to time. Um, in a dialogue, they're going to get off point and then come back to it. They'll make jokes with each other. Sometimes they'll end up in confusions that, that are deliberately there on Plato's part to help us understand what's going on in the text because he's sort of doing what a good teacher would do and saying you might be confused at this point so let me do a little bit more explaining over here. So that's all part of the genre. You want to pay close attention to who's speaking at which times but it's fairly easy for, for these parts. Now it, who's, who's involved in the dialogue? A dialogue is like a play. You have actual characters involved. The main guy here is Plato's teacher, Socrates, who is a philosopher, left an incredible impression on a number of people in, in Athens and elsewhere in Greece, and um, ends up getting killed by the city of Athens, actually executed um, in part because of the way he was doing philosophy. There's a whole story there that we won't go into. And Socrates is engaged in a discussion with some younger men. And, you know, we've got names for, for some of these guys, the ones who do the talking. They're Glaucon, Adamantus, Polemarchus, and this guy Telemachus. And I'll talk a little bit more about them in just a second. We want to think about it this way. You have Socrates, who's a middle-aged man at this point in his life, and he's invited to the house of one of his friends who's an older man, Cephalus. Cephalus shows up and then gets, gets out of there very quickly, and he says, I leave the argument to my son to, you know, he can be the heir and carry it on with you. And then it goes on for, for you know, pretty much the entire night. Um, these younger men are interested in big questions. So you could think about this as something like a dinner party where instead of just doing chit-chat and gossip, they're actually raising big questions. 
And with the exception of the one guy, um, um, uh, Thrasymachus, I think I may have said Telemachus before, which is wrong, Thrasymachus, um, they're all pretty polite. They're all what we would call people of goodwill. They want to get to the answers. They're, they may not, you know, back off on certain points. As a matter of fact, Thrasymachus is, is kind of a jerk. And um, there's, there's good reasons why that's the case, given his philosophy. And he's going to press really hard, but he's going to fail, and Socrates is going to, you know, more or less beat him. But then uh, Glaucon and Adamantus are going to say, you know, I'm not entirely convinced by your refutation of him, Socrates. He's got some points. Let's hear you actually address these. And that's how, after book one, the real, you know, ball gets rolling in, in the Republic through books one through, or books two through, through ten. So it's dialogical. There's a lot of back and forth. Um, they, they'll, you know, digress, return to previous points. Um, there's another thing that we need to think about. There is a point to this conversation. There is a, an overarching theme. And if you had to consolidate it in one word, it would be justice. And what the ancient Greeks meant by justice is a little bit wider than what we often mean. We tend to think about it solely in, in political terms or solely in you know um, criminal and judicial terms. But justice means right and wrong. So when we're talking about the universe, you know, being the kind of place where good people get their, their due and bad people get, get punished or, you know, have to go and do some sort of retraining or whatever it's going to be, that's a conception of justice. Um, my sharing with you the fruits of my labor that you contributed to, that would be another conception of, of justice. Those all fall under what the Greeks called justice. And so they're, they're trying to think about, well, what is this? And the reason why they have to do that is not because it's hard to come up with an answer. It's easy to come up with a million different answers. Uh, people do this all the time. They argue back and forth. The question is, which one is the right answer? And why is it the right answer? And that's why what we're doing here is, is philosophy. We're trying to think about not just what our beliefs or opinions are, but whether we have some good grounds for them, or do we need to change them? And you might find as you're reading this work that it, it raises challenges for you. Um, it might actually make you angry or upset to read parts of it. Um, and you should think about, you know, why you're having those sort of reactions to it. So they, there's a big issue, and they are, they're trying to think through that issue. Now that's going to require them to think through a whole bunch of other issues. Why? Why do things have to be so complicated? Well, because reality is complicated. Because human beings are complicated, and one, usually one big issue over here is going to be connected with a whole bunch of other important issues as well. So in order to be able to answer questions about justice, we actually need to know quite a bit of other things, like what are human beings like, and why do we have cities or, or communities? So those are important. This leads to the last point about genre. What we've got here is the articulation of a systematic, well-thought-out perspective. Not one that you have to agree with, by the way, um, but it is one that you do need to recognize that it is systematic, that, you know, Plato has thought this through quite a bit. If, if, you're, if you're saying, I just don't understand this, how could somebody be so stupid as to say this, you're probably not reading it right, because, you know, this, there's a lot of, of really brilliant thinking here. Um, what is going on in, in doing that? Well, Plato is using Socrates as a mouthpiece for his own thought in this dialogue, and Socrates will make a lot of important distinctions. When we're making distinctions, we're saying, this is not the same as this, and here's how they actually differ from each other. Here's how they're similar to each other. So if we're talking about, say, the human being, and whether our personalities are one unity, or whether they're composed of parts, we're making distinctions. Um, we also want to make connections. We want to draw out connections between things. Sometimes this is done by, you know, insights. Sometimes this is done by argument. Um, sometimes this can be done in a metaphorical way by telling a story, as is going to happen in, in here as well. So that's all important stuff about genre. Let's think now, just very briefly, because I'm not going to go into a great history lesson here, a little bit about the context.
because it is important with, with all of these works that we're going to look at to think about, well, why was the writer writing this? What is the situation in which he or she was, was writing? So it's written in ancient Greece. And ancient Greece, you know, we, we have got a lot of preconceptions about what that's like, oftentimes taken from TV shows or movies or comic books or things like that. Ancient Greece was not all the same everywhere. Um, there were a lot of different little city-states. Each one had its own history and its culture and its traditions. And there were a lot of people sort of wandering around going from city-state to city-state in the time that Plato's talking about. Um, resident aliens, we would call them now, or, or medics was the Greek word for them. Um, in addition, the Greeks were in contact with other peoples like the Egyptians or the Phoenicians or the Persians, their, their great enemy. The Greeks actually by this time had colonies in, um, in uh, what they called Magna Graeca or Great Greece, southern Italy and Sicily. They even had colonies, they were sprouting them uh, as far west as what's nowadays Marseille in, in France. So a lot of really interesting stuff going on. Um, we're talking here specifically the context about Athens in the 5th and 4th century BC. So the 400s and the 300s. Plato is born in the 5th century, dies in the, the 4th century, um, and so he's sort of straddling those. By the time the century turns, which of course none of them know because, you know, different dating system, they dated in terms of Olympiads. Um, by the time that, that it turns, Plato's become a young man and he's studying with, with Socrates and, and uh, pursuing philosophy. Now, Athens as a city uh, was one of the most important places in Greece. Um, if you want to pick three terms for Athens, three titles, they would be um, democracy, defender, and tyrant. Athens was a democracy. That didn't mean that everybody got a vote. As a matter of fact, it was a slave-holding society, like most places in the ancient world. And, um, you know, very few people actually did get to vote, but a proportion of them did, and they got to um, be involved in jury trials. That's how Socrates got killed. Um, and they were also entitled to participate in politics, in running the city, in, in running for office. So Athens was, you know, at one end, and then you have, you know, oligarchies like, like, or they called themselves aristocracies like um, uh, Sparta, but other ones as well at the other end. And you also had a hereditary kingdoms, um, tyrannies would arise. Athens actually was under a tyrant for a while. Um, but Athens was experimenting with this, this new kind of, of culture, de democratic culture, and that's part of what Plato is concerned about. He's not really a fan of democracy because he thinks that politics should actually be driven by intelligence or wisdom or, or knowledge. And when you're putting things to a vote, um, people are sometimes poorly informed and sometimes they're, they're prey to demagogues. So he's very interested in, in that. Uh, Athens was also a, a major defender of Greece. Gre Greece as a whole, they didn't call themselves Greece, of course, they called themselves Hellas, had fought a war as a bunch of loosely unified city-states against the vast Persian Empire. Um, and they, they, they won in the sense that the, the Persians didn't go any further. They didn't win in the sense that they liberated the Greeks that were under the Persians in Asia Minor. Um, but Athens had, had a lot of goodwill towards it because they had participated in that, because they'd fought at Marathon, for example. Um, Athens then forms a, a league and starts going around and making everybody else pay protection money to, to belong to this league, and Athens became a tyrant. So democracies, interestingly enough, at least in the ancient world, can become tyrants, um, you know, Having freedom at home sometimes means imposing unfreedom on other people. And Athens and Sparta end up getting into a war over a bunch of different issues, but in large part over two different models of how society ought to be. And these are two different models about the human, human condition. The Peloponnesian War does a lot of damage throughout Greece, ends up humbling Athens. Um, 
as well as doing a lot of damage to Sparta. And Plato is writing in the aftermath, the, the context of that. There's also some radical changes going on throughout Greece in culture, in the economy, in the ways that people are living. And the question is always, well, how should we respond to this? Do we, do we look back to the past and what worked in the past, or do we chart out some, some new thing, uh, or do we pick some ready-made thing that somebody's offering us, an alternative right in front of our eyes right now? And oftentimes none of these are particularly good answers. So Plato, his view is let's rethink things from the ground up. So we have to ask ourselves, what is justice? What is the good life? How should we live? Who should be in charge? There were a couple different uh, uh, alternatives being proposed. One view was, well, you could just go to the, the ancient poets because they had all sorts of wisdom about human life. So read Homer and memorize some verses and, and use those. The way that some people use the Bible today, uh, just proof texting, you know, coming up with ideas that way. Or they start quoting Thomas Jefferson or they quote, you know, Martin Luther King or whoever. Um, the idea is you can live by quotation. Um, there were also a bunch of people called the sophists. The, the sophist means somebody who's, who's claiming to have some sort of wisdom, and a lot of them claimed to be able to teach this. Some of them concentrated on rhetoric. Some of them said they could teach any subject whatsoever. Pretty big claim there. And they were going around, and they had a pretty important role in, in Greece. Plato is, and Socrates were opposed to them. Then you have the politicians. And many of the politicians were kind of making it up as they went along, but they, they claimed that they had some sort of better insight than other people. Plato wants to really put that to the test. He wants to ask, well, who really does possess wisdom or, or knowledge or talent or, or virtue? Who should we put in charge? Why should they be in charge? You know, it's not enough to just say, we don't like these guys that are in charge. If you're going to put somebody else in charge, you need to have some good reasons why. And so, you know, he's trying to think out the, the answers to these sorts of things, and that's what we're seeing in this text. Last thing I want to say is um, in these books and these selections that I have for you in this class, we're looking at certain main themes, certain themes that, that keep on coming up over and over again for us human beings. And they're all here in this work. So one of them is the, the origin or the reason for social existence for human beings. Um, another one is the consequences of picking one way of life or picking another way of life. Another important theme is um, you know, the idea that different people have different talents and that we should find roles for them to play if we want things to go well. Uh, and then that brings us to the, the idea of, well, how do we educate people? Do we have education just the same for everybody, or do we educate different roles different ways? Does that make sense to do? Um, here with Plato, we're also going to get into the philosophy of human nature and look at the parts or faculties of the human soul or personality. We're also going to look at um, ethics in terms of virtues and vices. And finally, we're going to talk about the relationship between politics and the political order and knowledge, knowledge of what truly is.